I'm going to have two presentations. The first is going to kind of frame this conversation around building your social credibility. On the left, your left, is Aaron Feuerstein. Aaron was the founder of Malden Mills, and in Massachusetts on December 11th, 1991, 92, his 5,000 person mill burned out. He made a remarkable decision. He decided to continue to pay his employees while he rebuilt. It was a privately owned business. He had insurance. He could, took his $250 million and retired at age 70. But he decided to continue to pay his employees. Very unique for the time. So this caught the attention of 60 Minutes, and Morley Safer asked him, while it might have been a high-minded moral principle to continue to pay your employees while you rebuilt the mill, but it couldn't have been good for business. And he said, well, Morley, it was good for business, but that's not why I did it. I did it because it was the right thing to do. In the center, the University of Michigan medical system, maybe it's a client. A few years ago, they were under major crisis, malpractice lawsuits accelerating, millions of dollars going out the door in, in malpractice lawsuits. The doctors that ran the hospital got together and asked, what business are we in? We're in the responsibility business. So they went to the corporate attorneys and said, we want to authentically apologize when we hurt a patient. And at the time, there were only three states in the union that allowed that without fear of you know, being guilty in a, a court of law. Well, the lawyers <laughs> didn't like that. They went back and forth. They were allowed to apologize, not out of Machiavellian effect, but when they genuinely felt they hurt the patient. And another remarkable thing happened. Malpractice lawsuits dropped by 50% in a year. Malpractice payouts dropped by 50%. They decided to take this authentic, personal, responsible behavior to other parts of healthcare delivery, and they achieved more positive delivery results of healthcare. And on the right, you know, there's all this talk about uh, Navy SEALs, and here's a, another exceptional Navy SEAL. This is a book I read, and I had to add this, is Adam Brown, Navy, you know, SEAL Team 6. His team took out Osama bin Laden, but Adam wasn't there because he died in 2010, a few months earlier. Uh, deflecting fire and saved 20 of his teammates. What made Adam Brown exceptional as a leader, he was always the first one to go through a door to fight the insurgents. He had to be the first one. And you know what could be on the other side of that door. He was always the last one to leave the battlefield. He, uh, what was great about him, he was, had a flawed personality. In, in high school, he got into drugs and he was arrested, and his mother broke down while he was being handcuffed and sent off by the police, and he made a commitment never to ever do that again, and he became a devout Christian and decided to commit his life to the team. Now, he went to, to join the Navy, and the Navy doesn't hire ex-drug addicts, you know, criminals, but they saw something in him. He became an exceptional leader. He almost lost his hand in battle, and he was the first uh, Navy SEAL to recertify. You don't recertify people with with the hang, fingers dan dangling, because you got to trust their marksmanship. He was the first. Remarkable of, of persistence and redemption. Now, why do I bring this up? It's great examples of exceptional behavior. Now, it's important to know where we've come from the last 100 years. In the early 20th century, what was the predominant self-organizing principle of the time? From World War I to the Great Depression to end of World War II, it was fear. After World War II, the family became the self-organizing driving force for relationships. Money in the 70s up to the crisis of 2008, the meltdown in the banking world, money drove our behavior, or drove our dignity, drove our exceptionalism. But since 2008, I believe relationships are the new currency. Personal responsibility is a differentiator, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that as we go forward. But we chose a management consultant in the past called Adam Smith. Now, he wrote the book Wealth of Nations. Have you guys, any of you guys read this book? This is the Bible of capitalism, market-based capitalism. Wall Street, most CEOs of companies have read this book. And you know what he was when he wrote this book, his, his role in life? Many people thought he was an economist. He was the moral philosophy chairman at Glasgow University. A moral philosophy chairman came up with the idea of mutual interactions, competitive interactions, manifested in markets at scale, but somehow he chose to interpret it as some laissez-faire zero-sum game. Why? Because we chose another management guru, the godfather, Michael Corleone. It's not personal. It's just business. Well, if business is over here 
and personal is over here. We get greed is good, too big to fail. Um, what happens in Washington is just politics. What happens in a Penn State locker room is just football. It's not life, it's just football. Is actually a rational scale uh, strategy for scaling. But that world does not exist anymore, guys, as you know. Personal and business have fused. Just ask your children, just ask the 1.4 billion people on Facebook, it's all personal. We've gone from hoarding to sharing, fortress to ecosystem, distant to hyper-connected. Everything was hidden, now it's hyper-transparent. And I talk to CEOs a lot about this and they go, I'm not sure if I want to be transparent. I go, well, try to guard the data, try to hide it. You're not going to be trusted, you've got to let it be a little bit more open, I'm going to talk about that. But I like the last bullet, outperform the competition, and this is my mission, my commitment to you if you decide to work with me long term to build your social cr credibility, to use social selling, to acquire relationships that transform into clients, customers, is to let's outperform the competition by outbehaving them. That's a more sustainable strategy today, I believe. And if we're no longer distant and everything is hyper-connected, then the 18th century philosopher David Hume comes back into the equation. With the, moral, with the moral imagination diminishes with distance. Well, there's no more distance. We need to reawaken morality and principle and ethics and the golden rule. We need to be more human. Why? Because we've gone from a connected to interconnected to morally interdependent world. Now, some people say that the opposite of love is not necessarily hate, but indifference. The opposite of morality is not immorality, but amorality. And the opposite of responsibility is not irresponsibility, but no responsibility. So I believe we're rising and falling together more than ever before. Why? Because a trader on Wall Street can lose a billion dollars on his desk, wipe out compensation for all his peers, and inject risk into the global economy. Because one vegetable vendor in Tunisia with a few cell phone camera friends can spark a revolution towards freedom in the Middle East. Why is this happening? Forbes, the bastion of capitalism, a few years ago had this cover of this article that always sticks with me. Welcome to the forthcoming social corporate revolution. That's coming right towards your business and your customer's business and your partner's business. You want to hear a great story of inspiration and personal responsibility? Martha Payne, a few years ago, a nine-year-old Scottish girl did not feel her school was serving responsibly nutritious food. So she started blogging. She got a million hits and almost $100,000 donated to her. The school got so much pressure, they banned her from blogging. So more hits to her website, more money contributed to her cause. The school relinquished and is now serving responsibly nutritious food. These are the people who are gonna work for you and for your customers. Personal responsibility, having a, a greater cause. Now, I believe we, we've entered the era of standard of trust behavior. Now, as you can tell, I'm pretty passionate about this topic and for talking about this for 10 years. And up till three years ago, I never had financial data to back up that ethical principle of behavior was actually good for business. But guess what? It is. So this is the three primary cultures of companies in the world today. And you guys know this. You know this better than I probably in your industry. So this is my methodology. I've kind of taken other people's data and this, I kind of created a methodology for assessing organizational culture. So the first and lowest maturity mindset is called conformity. It's rigid hierarchy, dictatorial mindset and coercion. Do it my way or get out. And then as you move up maturity, you, we, this is what the majority of companies, 43% well, are in that category. 43% of firms in the world are dictatorial. Agreed acquiescence, this, these are cultures that we're typically familiar with. Carrots and sticks, rules-based, the journey of success. This is traditional business as we know it. 54%, the majority of companies are in this category. So 97% of the firms and only 3% is what I call do the right thing, self-governing cultures driven by purpose and principle, values. It's a journey of inspiration and a purpose and it's less about rules, it's not letting the team down. That's what enforces behavior. No coercion or management supervision or risk governance policy is gonna enforce that. It's about intrinsic purpose that we learned a lot from the Dan Pink video. 
Now, what's really great, anything you want more of and anything you want less of that's good or bad, you want that's improving for the company, gets better. Innovation triples. You guys have great innovation, so you must have a great culture. Loyalty doubles with your customers. Satisfied customers more than double. Good reputation doubles. And finally, the most important for the keeping, you gotta keep score. I'm not saying that you, we all have to keep financial score. I'm trying to balance relationships and results. They're both important. But financial performance more than doubles at the very minimum. That's not bad. So why aren't more companies doing it? So I had a chance to meet a gentleman named Thomas Power. I'm not sure if you guys uh, go to Great Britain a lot, but the first online business network was not LinkedIn. It was eCademy out of the UK. And I was the first American to join this because I felt, God, online business network, what a great way to kind of build relationships from my computer. And he was making a lot of money, but Facebook and LinkedIn, because it's more of a free model at the time, really run roughshod over his business. But what was very interesting, he's had 600,000 customers around 56 nations. He traveled to those countries, met four people a day for 15 years, and he found out there's a mindset, the traditional in institutional mindset, especially as we do more relationship building on social, the traditional institutional mindset is closed, selective, and controlling. Closed about everything and everyone, selective about the data and people uh, uh, we pull into our view, and controlling of everything. This is a traditional profile of a CEO or a board of directors. It's very closed, very selective, very controlling. But we don't live in that world. We live in a networked world. And network thinking requires openness, accepting of randomness. And when I talk to a CFO, especially in CEOs about randomness, they look at me and they say, well, how often have you been burned by the reports that you get? Are you getting the accurate reports, making business? They're all, so you gotta be a little bit more accepting of intuition and gut and random. The, the data isn't always driving you to make better decisions. And they get that. And finally, supportive. Supportive of everyone and everything. So we're transitioning. I say we're on a 10-year journey for business to be from controlling, select, closed, con, uh, selective and controlling to open, random, and supportive. It's not gonna be an easy journey. I think firms like PeopleFluent will make the transition because you're not too big. The corporate risk, corporate governance will not outstrip the humanity. But I think the multinational, global, big behemoth companies are gonna struggle becoming more human, more supportive, more random. Oop. So let's get into social credibility and kind of the social layer. Social is not digital. Social is the conversational layer that rides over digital. So it's important to understand these conversations that I hope you uh, in, engage and connect with your customers and prospects and, and trust ambassadors. So I'm gonna engage you now in risks. I'm gonna talk about risks, because it's an important component of running a business, so, and your career. So ROI, risk of ignoring. I've been down this path a long time, and many business executives have been ignoring this revolution going on. We have over eight billion people in the world now, and one quarter of the people are on social three hours a day. So one quarter of the world, 2.5 billion people are on social at least three hours a day. And most businesses aren't. Now, I want to talk about, this is kind of my whiteboard, kind of the risk as, of, of approaching social as business as usual. So on the left, the y-axis is risk, is trust, and institutional thinking and time on the x. CEOs, command control CEOs, are less trusted, especially by the millennials generation. Broadcast marketing and PR are no longer as effective. Trust is dropping. Siloed information and people are not empowered. You get that. Based on, especially based on that last great presentation. IT and system restrictions are not set up for the way people work. Well, you're, you've innovated that. We've disengaged from the market and the customer. And flat sales has caused leaders to finally rethink ignoring you know, business as usual and do something different. So I believe we're shifting from a people-centric to a people-centric digital age, or dare I say, people-fluent digital age. New way of thinking. It's a culture and connection. It's a new way of operating around cloud and social channels. Collaborations, new way of working. You guys are leading the way on that. New way of marketing. 
Content is so critical to connecting and engaging with your prospects and your customers. And finally, there's a new leadership model that has emerged. It's less by authentic, autocratic, traditional power, but more community-based leadership, who, leaders of causes, they develop a following, and people defend them when things go wrong, and they bring them opportunities because they believe in the cause. Personal risk. If you ignore this, there's a danger. And the danger is, if you're invisible on social media, many people view you as irrelevant. Is that fair? I don't know. It's what it is. It's the new communication channel. Everyone's there. Everyone's at the, at the party. Why aren't you? Risk to too busy to notice. I, I coach many executives, and they're so focused on their email dashboard when so many customers and employees and partners are communicating on these other social channels. So that all this social revolution's happening under their radar. And thus they wake up one day and wonder why they aren't getting more responses to their email. Because their, cu their customers, their, their partners, their employees are communicating and they've kind of lost touch, a little bit disengaged from what's going on in a real time nature today. And great story around social media. The phone is ringing, but no one's listening. So I was telling this over lunch. I'm working with, uh, my partner's working with a large, the largest consulting firm in the world out of the UK. And up to 2013, they thought it was riskier to participate on social media than, to, than not. And what happened was the managing director was listening, and he was a, come, came from a generation where he's kind of thought that social media was a time suck. Like many, I'm sure a number of people here think it's a waste of time. And then uh, my partner pulled out a, a, an application called TweetDeck, if you're familiar with it. It's a real-time feed of what's being said about you on social. And this being the largest consulting firm in the world, I mean, there were real-time conversations going on, and he points to my partner and goes, Tom, uh, is anyone from my company listening to this? Where could I sign the contract? It happened like that. It's no longer too risky. You've got to at least, at the very least, listen to what's being said. Now, if you ignore this, the socialization of you, let's just talk about you and your personal brand, each individual in this room. If you ignore it, the next generation algorithms just came out this past fall. They're getting much smarter about making judgments about you. Now, are they perfect? Might they misjudge you if you're not nurturing what you stand for, what you believe in? what you do for a living? I think so. Why take that risk? You should be responsible for managing and nurturing your personal brand because your personal brand will affect people from its brand. It's, it's one team, right? Beyond. So just think of that. Nurture your own brand, personal brand. Don't let the algorithms make those judgments about you. Now, marketing is too important. I thought marketing was going to be in the room, so this is a little bit of a challenger slide. Marketing is too important to be left to marketing alone. We're all connected. We're all, we, if we believe in this company, and I've, this is the first time I've been face to face with people for it, I believe in you guys. I am so privileged to be in front of you. I think you have a great cause, a great mission, great technology, and a right place at the right time. Now is just get out there and start connecting with your prospects and your customers and start talking to them. And this slide basically dictates the drop. A few years ago, the single biggest drop in CEO trust happened in one year. This is the Edelman Trust Barometer, 12 points. And at the same time CEO trust dropped, average worker, average employee trust went up. Interesting, the power shift is happening. That's why CEOs are turning into ser and, and senior leadership are turning into servant leaders. Like Juan said, he's here to service you and support you. You're, everyone has to be the CEO of their own life and of their own territory. So now, on this slide, if you look to the right, this individual focused behavior, it's about building, I want to build you all as social credible leaders. If I have the privilege to work with you, each one of you or your teams, I will commit to helping you go up this trust scale to build your relationship capital. And it's, it's not an easy journey, it's a lot of fun if you're more open to new, learning new skills and getting engaged with a following that expects you to talk to them because they, they wait for your next post or your next blog article. They're, it's a really a fun journey, but it takes time to build it, and there's certain behaviors you need to practice to do that. 
And this is the hierarchy of social credibility. If you notice, this is kind of a match for Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So at the very bottom, and this color coding has to do with your, your social mindset. So profile at this level is, and this is what I typically get from senior leadership of business. They don't necessarily want to participate on social or post tweets or do selfies or anything, but they want to look good. So they want to have a nice professional LinkedIn profile, nice headshots, and, and the way you create the, the script for your LinkedIn profile. So they want to look good. That's the, that's the bottom. That's the, that's the hygiene. That's the foundation of social credibility. As you move up, it's about building a presence. People want to be in control. They want to be safe. They want to start experiencing social and, and build a network methodically, not in a random and crazy way. Participate. Now you're really engaging. You're taking part. You're connecting with customers and, and prospects and starting to talk. And I'm going to talk about that in social selling in a second. So you're really engaging, and that's a really important factor in building a, a tribe that follows you, believes in you, defends you when you make mistakes. And you will make mistakes. We're, we're human. Now publishing is when you be, let me ask you a question. How many in this room want to be a thought leader in their given industry? Right. When you hit yellow, when you start publishing and you build a following, you become a thought leader. Now what's great about being a thought leader is your reputation precedes you before you walk into that client meeting, that prospect meeting. That's a pretty, pretty fun place to be in. Who, what salesperson wouldn't want to be in that? So now, to go above publishing, is you, it's now you're a servant leader, you're a community leader. It's less about you, you've built up a following, people come to you to answer questions, to guide them, you're like a Sherpa, you're guiding them, you're a coach, you're serving them, you're supporting them, and it's less about you and more about your team. Now from a business standpoint, at the lower levels of presence and profile, it's about social networking. When you've got a company like PeoplePoint where everyone's participating on social, they're communicating internally as well as with their ecosystem, the customers and partners out there on social, then you have a real social business that's nimble, that's learning about trends quicker than your competition, that learns about opportunities before your competition. You're, you're in the digital and social flow. And then when you start publishing and becoming thought leadership, well now you, you're like a social media rock star they, they're, you're very visible by the analysts. People come to you for your opinions about topics. You're gonna, they're going to want to video you on YouTube and, 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 and talk to you and, and share your wisdom. It, it's a pretty powerful place to be. Now, if you guys are interested at all to know what your profile is, I don't own this technology. I get no financial benefit. It's, this is called Leadors, leadors.co.co. It's a, take you three minutes to take the assessment and it'll give you the response right away. If you take it, all I ask is take a screenshot of it and send it to me and I can, I'm happy to spend a little time on Skype with you and walk you through what that means. Because it'll give you an indicator of, as we move from this closed, selective, and controlling mindset and to a more open, random, how, how, how long is the journey gonna be for you based on your current mindset? There's eight profiles. This was based on those visits from all those countries and all those people to be the pure social person, to really build a following, you've got to be really purely open, random, and supportive. It took me 12 years. I'm a friend. You have to act like a friend. But the, the reality is, there's nothing wrong with any of these other profiles. In fact, if people from decides to develop a social selling and social credibility strategy and then execute that strategy in the market, my suggestion is to build an advisory board and find eight people that fit all these profiles. It's like the board of directors for your social selling plan. It'll be a great sounding board because all these roles run a business and they would be very effective in your social selling efforts. Now, I know what you're thinking. You know, maybe I'm nudging you a little bit. Yeah, this is something I may want to do for my own personal brand and to help me identify um, relationships that might help in my business. But it's a, how, I don't have much time. How much time is this going to take? Well, it takes me about a half an hour a day right now. But I'm, I'm using a number of tools, but this is a tool that came out of beta. It's called Scredible. Again, I don't own this technology. Um, they have a free version and a premium version. I'm using the free version. This is the next generation social credibility platform. What it does is you teach the algorithm um, what topics you're interested in. 
And for example, I did some research in preparation for this presentation on talent management. And there was actually, actually you were talked about in here in this article. It, it, the algorithm brought me this article. And I read it, and then I shared it with my, my, my following. And it simultaneously went to LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. And it was all about 30 seconds. Now, you don't have to share this. You can just use this as your own personal and professional learning tool to gather, the, prepare for a client meeting. Just gather knowledge. But there's nothing more inspiring when you start sharing and more thrilling when you start sharing material that other people don't know about and they come back to you on Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn and go, you found this. This is great material. Thank you. And you start getting that relationship capital built up. And you're going to get it from your customers. You're going to get it from your prospects. It's a great door opener. So Scredible, sign up for the free version if you want me to kind of walk with you. It's pretty self-evident. This is my kind of dashboard. They use the term bots. So I have kind of four areas I do research on, on professional speaking, on business coaching, on relationship capital knowledge, and, uh, and business development. And the algorithms in those four bots go out and find articles on English speaking websites, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm telling you, it's really building my social credibility, taking it to the next level. And I'm doing it in a lot less time. So now you know. No, most people don't even know about this yet. It just came out a few months ago. So in conclusion on social credibility, it's about attitudes. This is not a game that you have a conclusion, that you got an outcome. It's an ongoing behavioral change. You never quite get there. You're constantly developing your tribe. You're building your following. Your, um, so it's not a destination, it's a journey. And the skills is, if you're not using LinkedIn at a deeper level, we're going to talk about that in just a minute on social selling, but you need to get a little bit more knowledgeable on Google+, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. The behaviors, really just be, your, be authentic, show up every day, form a habit, spend a little time when you have gaps in your calendars to reconnect with your social network on the social platforms. And it doesn't have to be a distraction from your current job. It can help build your brand and build your credibility and open up doors. And my mission is not to talk about this because I'm so excited about social media. I want to do this because you guys want to grow your business. And this is what's great about this is that the risk to know, now that you know, and not to do is not to know. So it's up to you at this stage to make the next step. So now I'm going to talk about the art of relationship capital social selling. Relationship capital is my dogma, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Why social selling? Well, 40% of salespeople historically don't make their number. And I know that isn't what Juan and the team wants in this room. We want everyone to blow the number out. We want everyone to be financially and fantastically successful. So, but the firms that teach social conversations online, these are the innovators. These are not the laggards. The laggards are only teaching social conversations. Only 16% are doing that. Do you want to be a laggard? Do you want to be an innovator? So let, let's get on board here and, and try this out. And what's really interesting is that um, those salespeople that take this on have a 79% higher probability of making their number by using social selling. All the top business development people that I'm coaching that I know of are very good at this, better than I am. But before you start developing your social strategy, before you start getting out there, tweeting, creating updates, writing on LinkedIn, and, and sharing with your Facebook network, understand the anatomy of a B2B customer. 81% of B2B decision makers are blogging. Well, don't you want to be a peer to that B2B decision maker? Why don't you blog too? 74% use LinkedIn. Well, th that's a given, right? LinkedIn's the core for you guys, right? I think so. And most fascinating is 42%, minimum, 42% of B2B decision makers are using Twitter now. And I've met a lot of people that aren't using Twitter here. I think it's a great platform. It doesn't have to, you know, I can teach you how to do that in a way that doesn't take up a lot of your time and, and, and filter that stream of data, that information that can really help you be more aware of what's going on in your territory. IDC again. IDC is always coming up in the research one. So 76% of executives prefer that their vendors be recommended by someone they know. Hmm. The power has shifted, hasn't it, guys? The power used to be call the sales guy and bring him into the room, and he'll, he'll teach you. 
Now they do the research, they get it from their fr friendship, the power is shifted. I just want to take that, kind of balance the equation and get you guys engaged on social media earlier in their decision making, their research. Because the salesperson that connects with that research effort, that executive, that business decision maker, on, the, usually the first one that connects and makes an impression, usually wins the deal. 65% want a network of colleagues and friends and acquaintances which are critical for res reference checking. So they're going to check you out way before they bring you in the room. And another thing most of my, uh, I'm teaching this to salespeople I'm coaching, is most, and most aren't doing this, is introduce, even their prospects of yours, introduce your relationships to your targeted prospects. Introduce your relationships on LinkedIn to your current customers. They appreciate that. It's a great way to open up a door without overtly selling. If there's anything I want to make clear here, guys, is social selling is kind of a misnomer. It's about building relationships. It's very soft. I'm going to talk about that. It's the secret sauce. So if you, and if you, I know you guys get this because based on everyone I've met, they're very good at building relationships. So what is relationship capital? This is my team's definition. We believe it's the, at the intersection of this Venn diagram. Your brand promise, you personally, you people fluent, how you behave, and what people think you are. At that intersection, if everything's in congruence, you build relationship capital. If your brand promise doesn't match your behavior or doesn't match the reputation that you spent precious marketing resources and PR resources to build, then you'll lose it. The account gets debited. Because I follow the Stephen M. R. Covey view of trust from a business context. It's like a, I'm like viewed as an emotional bank account expert. Stephen M. R. Covey talks about the emotional bank account. Well, this is what it is. You build positive perceptions in a meeting with a client, a customer, a prospect, cha-ching, the register goes off. They, they credit you. You move the relationship along in a positive way. You say something that's disparaging about the competition. You don't show up to the meeting on time, whatever. Gong, the debit goes off in their heads. Now, this has always been happening in the offline world. It's getting more tangible in the online world. And the algorithms are going to be measuring these unstructured words, these conversations, and making judgments. So this is the only test. I want to get your thoughts on this, guys. Which one is a uh, exaggeration and which one is the truth? Number one, the sales and marketing process has forever changed. If you do not adapt, your social savvy competitors will leave you and your quota in the dust. Number, and the second one, if you want to gain new customers, there is only one way to reach them today, and that is by aggressively selling them through social channels, which is the exaggeration. The le the, yeah, the, the, the bottom one, right? If you are going to aggressively sell people on social, you're going to be a pariah. People are not going to follow you. <laughs> They're not going to retweet you. They're not going to share comments on your LinkedIn blog posts. It's not about aggressively selling. The truth is the sales and marketing process has changed. We all know this forever. We have to adapt. This is the, the premier communication channels that people and our customers and prospects are using. We need, as relationship developers, be there. Now, social selling is the identification, targeting, proactively reaching out to prospective and existing customers to build mutually beneficial connections and relationships. So my advice at a high level is to start with your current customers, because that seems to be where the, the low-hanging fruit is, and identify those people you want to connect with uh, on LinkedIn. Start with LinkedIn, but cross-sell your relationship on Twitter, Facebook, and Google+. So start there. Start with, you can do it with prospects, too. But if for the sake of time, you may want to start with your current customers, because that's where you want to leverage. You know, you talk about political strategy on the complex sale. Well, Social selling fits very well into the political strategy. You're going to know things that other people don't know about. You're going to meet people who have power that you can't see on the traditional org chart. Right? This is great for knowledge before you come into that meeting. Social selling is not buying a list of leads and calling everyone. It's a, dis a disruptive process pushing out marketing messages. It's not that. It's not lead scraping. Most senior salespeople I coach 
want to lurk on social. They want to, they want to see who, who, what competition is having what conversation on social. And then they want to get an email address so they can, or a telephone number, and push. Yeah, it's, if you do that, that's just another form of cold calling. It doesn't really work that effectively anymore. And what's really great about social selling, and you guys get this, it's very soft. It's consultative. It's, it's just like consultative selling face to face. It's asking questions and engaging in meaningful and relevant conversations. Being more social, not being invisible, not you know, engaging, listening. Listening is very important. Conversing about what the customer needs are, talking about their needs, their problems, and not being a bull in the china shop to rush to share your people fluent solution before you've earned the relationship capital to sell to them. Very dangerous if you do that too early in the relationship, especially on social. So now what ponds should you be fishing in? Many people think that fishing is a very kind of random, throw the line in the water. If you talk to the top professional fishermen, just like you're building, you're investing in strategy and in tools and in, uh, in taking your sales organization to the next level, social selling is a very methodical plan, prepare, execute, see what's working, adapt, repeat the process. So, but what ponds should you be on? There's a lot of them, right? And there's more coming. I think you should be on these four. LinkedIn, obviously, because that's where your B2B customers are, but they're on all of these. Google Plus, because of the algorithm and Google search, you, you know. Especially as you start building social credibility, you'll start showing up on Google searches, maybe talking about talent management or human capital management. You start getting associated with those words, and Google Plus seems to help with that. They're adapting to become more of an online community, so I'm not gonna, many people are writing them off. I still think you should be on it. And Twitter and Facebook. Twitter, most people use it as a bullhorn, just to broadcast. But if you listen and you and connect with people and you have meaningful, rel relevant conversations with your prospects and customers, you will be light years ahead of your comp most of your competition. Now here's another area that I'm very impressed with the people for instance, marketing of posting of the videos. I've been going to a number of your webinars. Uh, I really like them. You're, you're ahead of many companies that I deal with. Um, but one area you may want to consider doing more of is Pinterest and Instagram. If you could take your talent management, human capital, and, and put that in a picture and post it to Pinterest and Instagram, pictures speak a thousand words. I think, obviously video, but I think there's a, if you can carve out a little time with marketing to post pictures, I think that's gonna help you with your social credibility as an organization, as individuals. Blogs, single biggest thing to my business is when I started blogging. You know, instead of just short bursts of wisdom that I'm pretty good at, going deeper with, with more advanced blogging about topics such as business trust and credibility and business culture and transforming and building better engaged teams that fulfill their commitments and don't let each other down, that seems to resonate. So I'm passionate about the topic and blogging gives, seems to be giving me credibility. I highly recommend that people point blogs. All the frontline people, I believe, should be blogging. And you don't have to, sp I can show you ways to kind of do your research in a methodical time, efficient time. But I think you'll enjoy it if, once you, if you are open enough to, to learn that skill. Online communities. I, I don't know if you guys are on various talent management digital communities, but I think you should be if you're not. That's, a lot of people are talking about solutions and, or problems that you can provide solutions to. And you need to be where these conversations are taking place. Social selling ponds, you, are you guys on LinkedIn groups? Various talent management, human capital, you guys, you guys having any success connecting with anyone? I think that's a good area. If you're gonna prioritize LinkedIn groups, being very judicious, I wouldn't be on too many. I cut back from 40 LinkedIn groups, I'm down to five. You can't be on all of them, you can't do them justice, so be very judicious in which LinkedIn groups to really focus your biggest bang for the buck, and you can find those. You, there's a lot of groups in, in your area of human capital and talent management and, and vendor. Quora, great. Ask a question and find the whole digital tribe wanting to answer it. Or people, your clients are doing research and asking a question about how do I build better engaged customers more efficiently? Well, you can answer that question on Quora. 
what a great way to kind of meet people, and you're gonna, I guarantee you're going to find uh, customers. Social selling pods. These have been the most underutilized by business. Forbes, Wall Street Journal, you've you got to register your public identity. Thought leaders write a post about talent management. You as a credible leader at PeopleFluent make a comment. You, people see that. You build credibility one comment at a time. You, the, the tribe thinks that you're an expert. Before you know it, you've got prospects sending you an, a message from LinkedIn saying, hey, I saw your comment. On, on the Huffington Post or on the Wall Street Journal, it really resonated with me. Can we get together and talk a little bit about something I'm working on? That's happening to me all the time. Now, it took me eight years. I want to cut that time frame down from nine to 12 months for you guys and not have to do all the lessons that I had to learn over eight years. And as the one thing I've heard from the team, the leadership here at PeoplePoint and from various people I've met today, social selling is a team sport. Now, you can have great successes finding big wins and hunting the elephant as an individual contributor, but when you got marketing, sales, and customer service working together as a team, why is that important? It's important because your customers are using social for various reasons. They're doing their research. They're looking for vendors. They're airing their grievances. Great story is there is a hotel chain in Chicago where uh, a thought leader flew into Chicago and these very popular hotels screwed up their hotel reservation. They had no hotel room. The thought leader aired their grievance on Twitter and their competitor was listening on Twitter. And the competitor could have been really a kind of, they did a very nice job of responding. They said, we're sorry for your bad experience. Next time you come to Chicago, we'd be more than happy to have you serve you. As, as our customer. They didn't disparage the competition, and that got so viral. People said, wow, what a great way to, you know, they did it in a very nice way. They weren't belligerent. It wasn't overt selling. That's what's happening more and more, and you want to engage in those conversations at social. But if you don't do that, if you don't act as a team, and how you're going to get customers who might have, have a bad day with people fluent, they go air their grievance on Twitter, and customer service is dealing with more immediate problems that are being filtered via email, you're the salesperson, you want to sell, you don't want to be solving customer service problems, but you got to work as a team to orchestrate how that, get, you can't just drop that ball. That, that'll hurt your reputation. So it's a team sport, and I know that you guys are building one team. So now I want to talk about the top 10 rules. I'm almost done, guys, so I'm trying to go as fast as, because I know I'm between happy hour here and Q&A. So we're speaking a new language in social media. So the rule number one, keep this high level. Be genuine, be authentic, just be yourself. Be consistently yourself. Don't be different offline as you are online. Be yourself, be genuine. Listen, listen, listen. Good conversations start by listening. So listen to what's being said on the various social platforms. Because if you don't listen well, and some people say listening is an important skill for most salespeople, and I would agree, right? I think most of us would agree, right? So listening is the same. If you're consultative selling on social, listen. Find out what the words they're using. Don't want to misinterpret the message because your response could do damage. And it might be someone, it could be that big elephant you're hunting for. It's so, it's so interesting. So you got to be listening and interpret the message correctly. Be responsive. Really be proactive in response. If someone's got a problem that you could provide a white paper or a video link to a people fluent webinar, don't, don't drop that ball. Carry that. Be, be like a concierge at a fine hotel like this. Be customer service oriented. Don't be different than you wouldn't in a face-to-face -face meeting. And as Juan said, be likable. That'll go a long way. Be, you'll be a friend. Now, I bring up rule number four, follow the leader. So if you're on those LinkedIn groups that I think are really important for our people fluent, and you're not quite sure how to behave, first thing is what are the rules of this LinkedIn? LinkedIn groups are very, very rules-based. So you don't want to violate the rules and post something that you shouldn't have posted because that'll do damage to your building trust in the group. So read the rules and then follow the conversations. Find out who the leaders of these LinkedIn groups, these talent management, human capital management groups are, and you'll find out, you'll kind of get the sense of what's the right way to communicate and act 
um, because you don't want to jump right in and stick out and make a, a social mistake. Um, so follow the leader. That's the first advice on these, especially on LinkedIn groups. Tailor the conversation. It's not about people fluent messaging so much. It's about what's the customer language they're using. And tailor their words with your words and, and be, be in synchron, synchronicity with how they're communicating. Kind of obvious, right? Be helpful. Helpful goes a long way. Be cheerful, helpful. It's amazing the type of relationships you can build. I've never been happier in my life. I you know, have this global kind of tribe and presence, and, and uh, I try my best to always be optimistic and positive, and otherwise, don't go online. <laughs> You're just going to, it'll be seen, it'll be felt, trust me. So be helpful. Now, there's a proper way to enter a conversation. It's just like going to a social event. Physically, you're in, you're in a beautiful uh, 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 meeting room, and you're networking with uh, fellow executives and, and partners, and you see two people talking about a topic, and you're listening politely, and you see they're talking about something that people fully can help with. So, so you're going to immediately interrupt those two people and say, hey, I can help you with that. Would you do that physically? Well, would you do that online? Because you might see a conversation on Twitter that's to a customer, could be a competitor talking to one of your customers or talking to a, a prospect. Are you going to interrupt them? Say, hey, I can help you with that. How well does that go over on social? It doesn't, right? So enter properly. And it's equally appropriate how to exit. Because what I've noticed is if you like to argue or like to debate, there's certain people that might challenge a people fluent solution or want to be belligerent and want to be confrontational with you. It could be a customer. It, you know, they might have a bad day. Or they, well, don't wrap it up. You could easily explode into an argument. And I've seen that a lot with people. Um, don't just hang up on them. Just don't disconnect on Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn. Just, you don't just stop. If someone asks a question and you can't answer it, but you think you can go get the answer, then commit to getting the answer and get back to them. And if you... Uh, Another important aspect, if you think that, you know, I talk about the integration of personal and professional, but if you think that you can't integrate that, then my advice is keep your Facebook, have a personal Facebook, and have a people fluent Facebook account. It's harder to keep them separate, guys. My advice, if you can, have one Facebook, you know, and be yourself. You know, one thing, it's, you don't have to be completely professional and formal. You can be a little informal on social. One of the ways that I'm informal, the only thing I really talk about from an informality aspect is my 16-year-old pug, Sarge. If I don't post his picture once a week on Facebook, I get 10,000 people getting very upset with me. He's a Facebook rock star, so you know, I had a chance to meet the CIO of Accenture, the global CIO, and he talked about how if he didn't talk about his dog on his weekly IT conference call, that the millennials would turn him off because he was too formal in his, in his Skype meetings. It's fascinating. Being a little informal is not a bad thing. And be consistent. Show up week in, week out, day in, day out. I can help you schedule your posts so you can have a week or two week in advance so you don't have to be constantly taking time out of your day to schedule um, or to post you know, to keep visible on social. It's not that hard. There's a lot of technologies to kind of create the content, curate it, and share it. And you'll consistently build your credibility, but you got to be consistent with it. Too many people I've met who might they look really interesting, they post something, and then you don't hear from them in a month. You can't just dip in and go out. That doesn't build trust. It's not going to be credible for you. And admit when you're wrong. So true story, if you probably detected already, I'm not perfect. And I wrote a blog article on, on LinkedIn and uh, talking about uh, social business and uh, it was an excerpt from my book, and uh, I misspelled an IBM social business executive I met at an IDC conference in Chicago a few years ago. I thought her name was Pam Chandler, and I wrote it down as Pam Chandor. Well, it sounds like a minor thing, right? But a thought leader read my article, loved my article, and then he posted a comment saying, hey, I'm not sure if this is a credible article. I did a Google search. I can't find this Pam Chandor. Well, I did the research. I corrected it, and then I apologized to him publicly for the mistake. It seems minor, but then that afternoon he followed me. He connected with me on LinkedIn and Twitter, Facebook. So apologies, build authenticity, 
show vulnerability. You're not perfect. Don't try to hide it. Don't get angry about it. Just, if you made a mistake, just, I'm sorry. People appreciate that. Most people appreciate it. So now, this doesn't really show well. Um, how do we measure progress? Because we're, we're about getting stuff done, and we want this all to transform into customers at the end of the day, right? We generate revenue. What I use is clout. It's an algorithm, uh, K-L-O-U-T. Does anyone follow their clout score here? It's, it seems it's working for me. I'm not sure how you guys feel about it, but I'm, I'm seeing my cloud score kind of correlating with I'm able to move people through my sales funnel and I'm tracking my cloud score. And I, if I keep it you know, at a certain level, it seems to be building my credibility. If it, I, most people, if you see anyone with a cloud score of 50 and they think they know social media, they don't really know social media. Um, I'll give you an example. So there's some examples of some thought leaders and businessmen who are on cloud. Peter Cashmore, the, the uh, publisher of Mashable, has an 89. That's pretty powerful influence score. That means people retweet his stuff, they share his comments, he gets people to move. We want people to move. Uh, so these are some examples. Seth Godin's a 79, you know, 75, 72 and up is thought leadership. I think I, if you work with me and give me four months of your devoted openness, I could get you to 60. That's pretty good. Now, what's my score? 77. That's, and I noticed I went to a social credibility conference in London and I connected with all these like-minded birds of a feather who were passionate about social business and social credibility and, and it really, we connected, we formed groups, we were really promoting each other, helping each other and it, it boosted my cloud score by about four points. And, and when you're in the 70s, it's not easy to move the number. It gets harder and harder. If you hit 80, that's like celebrity status. 77, I'm pretty, from a business standpoint, I'm very happy. So my advice, and if you guys execute social selling as a, uh, as a extend your sales process, and again, I haven't made this clear, I'm not asking you to replace your current sales process. I'm just asking you to extend it with social selling. You are already, already mastered, and you're gonna master new methodologies, but social selling is just an extension. Do you guys have enough leads? Would you like more leads? This is, what are you gonna do it through cold calling? This is it, this is the channel, this is the phone. This is the phone of the 21st century. Now, if people like you, they'll listen to you, which is important. But if people trust you, we all know this, they'll do business with you. That's why relationship capital is the currency. Being trusted, having a reputation, a credible reputation is gonna open up doors. It's more about pull and a lot less about push. And I love this acronym. If there's anything I leave with you and you give me my feed, feedback about how I did today, is KLTR. Get known, get liked, get trusted, and get referred. And repeat that, and I guarantee you're gonna blow the number out. I guarantee it. There's no reason, you got all the things in place, now you extend it with the social and get engaged on these social conversations. You will, over time, convert some of these relationships to business opportunities. It's not easy. It's not something you can do at the end of a quarter to sell software and turn it on. You gotta like prime the pump and keep consistent at it and build that relationship capital and then one day you're gonna get that call from a partner, from a prospect saying they wanna talk to you. That's, that's kinda what it's about. So this is my quote. It seems to have worked with, had a chance to meet the Federal Reserve Bank and they wanted to know about relationship capital, open standards, new metrics for capitalism. And I said, well, what did the Japanese do in the 70s that was an intangible? They turned it into a winning advantage. Quality, they, quality before the 70s was some amorphous thing that no one really used it to any winning advantage. The Japanese turned it, they, you know, disrupted the automobile industry, right? Well, the same's happening with your relationship capital, guys. Relationship capital is the single thing for long-term distinction and sustainability. Strategy is important. Strategy is very important. You gotta have a good strategy but it's not long-term. Technology is great, it's important, but it's not long-term, it gets leapfrogged. But your culture, your reputation, your credibility, that distinguishes you and shortens the cell cycle. And what I like to say, the era of standard of trust leadership is how we connect, how we collaborate, how we engender trust, how we keep our promises, and how we earn relationship capital is the source of competitive advantage. 
So I wrote, wrote a book about this called Standard Trust Leadership. You, uh, you, you purchased 80 copies. I'm sure you'll distribute it, Juan. And I want to thank you for your time. This was a really pleasure, guys.